Okay, so I'm in now, which is all good. Um, <coughs> there, there, that was a bit of a problem. WebEx is fantastic, but when it doesn't work, it's really annoying. So thank you so much. Um, I hope you can see everything. This is Swissy. I'm going to start actually with something else, but just let me just inform uh, that I'm in now. Uh, so people aren't working busily behind the scenes trying to get me in. Uh, Ray, good morning. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, great. Uh, let's get going. Uh, I'll tell you what I'll do as well. Just pull up a few bits here. Right, let's let's start with the euro. Let, let's start clear and simple. I mean, if you wanted another reason uh, to sell the euro, you got it yesterday, obviously. Uh, Dissel, uh, Jerome uh, Dissel Bloom, Bloom, Bloom uh, came out and said um, that basically the idea of bail-in, the idea of um, depositor haircuts was uh, a template that could be used everywhere else. Well, what do you th where else do you think it could be used? I'd say Italy and Spain, potentially. Um, so that was kind of the, that kind of set, set off this wave of selling. Let's take a look at the hourly just to look at it. Look at that. That was his work. They were his work. Well, in fairness, his words are probably from just around about that 130 handle. I think that, you know, post the Cyprus bailout, um, the rally was really very half-hearted. As you can see, we didn't even get back up to that 131 level. We'd been higher than that, even when Cyprus was still in the middle without a bailout. So it really suggests sentiment is draining. Um, it was a bit of a buy the rumor, sell the fact type of event. So we kind of bought all the, you know, bought all the way up here. Um, this was the rumor of Cyprus getting this bailout and the fact that it would be okay and then sell the fact. And that, and that, ha that does happen. Um, someone has just mentioned, again, a lot of hearsay actually going on about what's happened in Cyprus, that Russians withdrew money from Cyprus while banks were closed, some branches in the UK remained open. Uh, I do believe that uh, branches of Cypriot banks in the UK did remain open, but I, I'm no expert in that matter, so I uh, can't really, uh, can't really deci decide. But uh, one thing I can probably talk about better is, is what the euro did. So, you know, as I said, we kind of bought the rumor, saw the fact, very, very typical FX reaction really to this. We've seen it in the past past that in the lead up to an EU summit, you get kind of a anticipation building that something will be done, that it will all be all right. And then it sells off uh, once you actually get that, okay, fine, uh, Cyp Cyprus or the Eurozone isn't going over the edge into, fi into financial Armageddon. Um, so we saw that we, we were selling off before those comments about the template and about the fact that, you know, all Eurozone banks... Uh, deposits over 100,000 could be at risk. Um, we, we've seen that. Now, where does that lead us now? I mean, this is a very short-term chart. It's only an hourly. As you can see there, uh, the MACD is, you know, sentiment is improved. Momentum is, as, as, uh, as just momentum to the downside has stopped, certainly on the short term. Uh, we found some very good support there at 128.50. But really, again, you know, it just looks like we're pausing for breath. Um, I would say, you know, some people say, you know, what is this? Is this a euro sell-off? Is this going to be a cross market? Is this a risk-on, risk-off situation? I would argue absolutely not. I think the FX market is moving to the beat of its own drum. I think that, you know, um, the stock markets today in Europe, they have been slightly higher, even though the rally is quite tentative. Um, they, they, they have recouped some gains. Um, even the, even the FTSE, the, the uh, Milan index, so the Italian index, is actually managing to just about, say, in positive territory. Um, and yet we've seen, and we've seen this kind of consolidation. So, yes, things are kind of moving in the same direction, but I think the idea of, I think that, it, you know, I think the euro, you know, sentiment to the euro is um, is remarkably weak, and I think that you know, on any pullback, maybe back towards kind of 129, 129, 50, where as you can see, this kind of cluster of daily move of hourly moving averages lie, um, is going to be used to to as good selling opportunities potentially uh, to get back back down to those November lows. Let's take a look. So this this is now the level that we're targeting here, the 126.60 level. You've probably heard a lot of people talking about that and um, there's a few levels um, from now on that it, from right now that a lot of people have been chatting about uh, the first one obviously being 128.80 um, which had been the 200 day moving average or obviously of, of course that's uh, moved higher a little bit now 127.70 which is the 68 uh, fib retracement level um, from the uh, from the 
uh, high all the way back down to this kind of low here. Um, we also had, of course, this 126.60 level, which is the November lows. So we are, um, you know, there is a lot, there are a few levels few support levels we've been talking about. Two of them we've kind of cut through. Um, no, I don't think I want to join that. Here we go. Let me just get out of that. Sorry, one moment. My machine is going a bit crazy. Um, I, you know, we've gone, we've we've sliced through some key resistance levels, some key support levels, and that does really open the way to these lows here from November, which is 126.60. So if you hear of people talking about it, um, I know a lot of a lot of the blogs are, you know, a lot of um, kind of. Uh, bigger institutional players are talking about 126.60. It could be used as a buying zone. I think, you know, I'm not saying that we're going to absolutely decline and, and, and get back down to those kind of, you know, July lows of 120. I think the situation is a little bit more at hand now. But overall, you know, there's a few things that are, that are very weak for um, the euro. Obviously, the first thing is... Um, Obviously, the first thing is uh, that we've got um, the bike, bank, banks in Cyprus are still closed. The second thing is that there's going to be capital controls in the Eurozone nation. First time that's happened. Uh, the second thing, of course, the third thing, sorry, of course, is that growth is incredibly weak. Um, we're not really getting too many signals one way or the other. I just want to um, add up my add up our an uh, RSI just to show you there. Kind of again, like you know, momentum indicators really showing us um, that we are moving sideways here. Um, you know, there isn't any, there isn't, there hasn't been massive amounts of um, direction one way or the other. Yes, we're moving lower, we know that, but it's not going down in like, you know, big, short, big, uh, sharp jumps. Let me just increase our size here, remove that study. You know, what we've seen kind of in, uh, en route from those comments from um, Draghi is some really d large down days. Now, we did technically get that yesterday, but we didn't really break any fresh ground. Um, so that's kind of what I mean. Whereas in the past, you know, that, that was Draghi in the February in the yeah, the February meeting. Um, these are been a few other kind of Cyprus Italian relate, related things. We haven't really seen that. And you know, there is a limit to downside when you're talking about Cyprus because obviously people, some people still think it is a special case. Um, and I think that you know when you're looking more at, fund, at the fundamental backdrop, so the fact that things are very very weak, the fact that um, yes, we've had Cyprus go to the wall or just about managed to avoid going to the wall. Um, but right now, I think, you know, a lot of people are starting to shift and their concerns are maybe not actually just about Cyprus, but France. I mean, it's PMIs last week were, as weak, were weaker than some peripheral nations. We just got some consumer confidence data out of France earlier. Again, very, very weak. It's going to miss its deficit targets, miss its growth targets. Politics there, nightmare. Um, you know, France is a real concern now. And I think, you know, what we've seen in the past with the Eurozone crises is that they incubate. So rather than kind of causing, you know, rather than people kind of um, sitting there and, and, you know, selling the euro because of all of the problems that the eurozone is now facing, it doesn't really, that's not the way the markets work. The problems kind of incubate, they think about them, um, you know, it, it's difficult to, it's difficult really to, to, contextualize or to even think about the scale of a problem like France getting into into trouble um, you know that really is problematic so um, you know these problems incubate and, and for us those of you who've seen our Q2 outlook you might have joined our um, our, our webinar which came which was uh, you know just a, last week um, you may have seen that you know what we what we've been what we were concerned about um, is, is or what we think for the second quarter is that within this incubation period, things aren't terrible. Things, sorry, things aren't great by any means, but equally they're not terrible and we're not falling through the floor. So problems in the eurozone exist, um, but what does that mean? You know, that's a, that, that's all great to talk about around kind of dinner parties or whatever. What does it mean for the trader? Well, I think it means that probably, um, you know, a big level like 126.60 will be respected and that we could meander down to it. Now the other thing that I would talk I would point out 
this week as well, is that it is the Easter holidays. So um, we, you know, markets in Europe are closed Friday and Monday. Uh, there might even be a bit of thinning out of liquidity as we get towards the week, the weekend. Now there are a couple of risk events I want you guys to remember because I know obviously, you know, Ahmed's uh, comments and and um, we've, we've had lots of I've had lots of comments from from you guys um, and from and from other clients and, and journalists alike. But um, people are they're really con they, they are consumed by the site by Cyprus and its bailout process. Now there are a couple, so I'm going to just give you a couple of um, risk events to watch out for. Number one, that is the German parliamentary vote. That should take place at some point, um, pretty soon. So basically, once the, the steps for Cyprus getting its bailout, it had to be agreed by the Cypriot Parliament, had to be agreed by the EU IMF ECB, and it had to be, and, and now it has to be agreed by Germany, by German Parliament and the Dutch Parliament. And uh, the reason why is that these countries um, have a law that, you know, if their money is going to a bailout fund, then they, their, government, their governments need to be aware of where that money is being spent. So uh, the Dutch one we think is okay, but the, um, the, it's, it's the, um, the German one that we think is going to be slightly more problematic. We know there was a lot of resistance to bailing Cyprus out anyway in the Bundestag, uh, which is the German Parliament building. So we don't know the exact date that's going to take place. What we do know is that all Easter holidays have been cancelled for German parliamentarians. And um, we so say there's a good chance that it could be done either um, later this week or very early next week. Uh, we did hear from a few of them yesterday, who, which uh, was just saying that they needed to know more details. So, you know, this is just the beginning for Cyprus really um, even today you know we, we've, we saw um, you know obviously we had those comments yesterday about you know this is going to be a, um, a, a template for the rest or a prototype for how other bailouts in the future are going to work uh, which is a big departure for the Eurozone suggests they're getting much more and they're playing hardball when it comes to uh, the um, uh, bailouts that they are not just giving money away willy nilly um, that there's much more kind of stringent um, requests for them um, what we've uh, what, what we heard this morning was actually some ECB members backtrack from that so row back on those comments say that no Cyprus is an unusual circumstance um, I think at the end of the day is that you know as obviously as more and more dominoes drop, it's getting harder to finance them. And yes, Cyprus is a really tiny country. They could have well afforded to, to sort out Cyprus, but they wanted to use Cyprus as a bit of a prototype so that if we get bigger countries where we know bailout funds won't stretch that far to look after them, um, that the idea of a bail-in with the country actually helping itself out um, it becomes precedent. Uh, that seems kind of uh, clever to me, actually, and could actually reduce, reduce risk going forward. It doesn't feel like that at the moment and that's not what the markets think. Um, so, but, but keep that at the back of your mind. So basically that German vote I think is going to be, um, is going to be the kind of the next key thing. Obviously any problems if it's not, um, if it's not passed or if there's a hold up then we could easily get down to 126.60. Otherwise we think right now you know the, the range, let's take a quick look at that. As you can see, you know we've tried to get kind of 129.30ish sub 129, 128.50 sorry sorry, 128.30, 128.50. Um, as you can see, very long lower hourly shadows. And that suggests that there is some buying interest. Um, so it suggests that there is, um, you know, that there, are, there is a little bit of buying interest. I mean, not much, that's for sure. And the market is trading in a very, very tight, tight range uh, with 128.80 on the upside, 128.30 on the downside. Now, right now, what could move that going forward? What could move that in the, in the next few hours? For us, that could potentially be the dollar side of the euro-dollar equation. Um, any expectations on U.S.? confidence. Yes, uh, I'm just going to talk about that now. Um, I just want to bring up the dollar index as well. Uh, but basically what we have today is you, a raft of US economic data. We have durable goods sales due at 12.30. We also have some home price data. Uh, durable goods sales, they're always ones to, one to watch. Um, basically because they can be quite volatile number. Uh, the market, let me just get you the exact thing that the market is looking for. 
the market is looking for a yeah a 3.9% rise that comes after like a 5.2% drop uh, for January so these goods orders can be can be quite um, quite volatile uh, even the underlying ones so the ones um, which by stripping out transportation orders etc etc can be very volatile last month they were up 2.3 this month 0.6 um, so uh, do watch out for that also new home sales are out um, for February again a very volatile index they're expected to fall 3.9% but remember, the the weather could be a big impact on that. So um, what we see, what we what we what we are seeing is that there's a lot of uncertainty around euro dollar today. That the re maybe the one reason why people have just stopped short of pushing it below that 128.50 level is this economic data. Now the economic data is really important in the U.S. right now, and um, we know that fundamentals are having a big impact on what the dollar is doing. Um, I just want to show you the dollar index just to illustrate that point. If we look at the beginning of March. So here, big sharp move higher. Let me just zoom in on that. Hang on. So uh, beginning of March, what date was it? It was like the, the yeah, like the 8th of March. That was that big move higher. That was all payrolls, um, a, a very strong payroll number from the U.S. Um, again, we've seen you know some nice big moves higher, safe haven flows, but also economic economic data related flows. So we had some good economic data um, out of the U.S. last week as well. Um, that's all being reflected in the market. That's all being reflected right now in the markets um, and in in the way that the dollar is performing. I mean, just going back, say the last few uh, weeks. We had some uh, some good. Uh, we've had fantastic jobless claims, uh, a rebound in the Philly Fed, um, and this is just one week's worth of data. Fairly good, a very good Dallas Fed yesterday. So all all of this is quite good. Um, obviously balancing that out, of course, we had the we had the FOMC, which was slightly more dovish than expected. But it just goes to show, you know, when was that payrolls? Let me just get the exact date for you. Yeah, it was the eighth. So it was this day here. Um, which is when we got that big up day um, in, the, in the dollar, big bullish engulfing line there, big, very bullish candlestick pattern. Um, that was on the back of the, that much better than expected payrolls where we got 236,000 jobs created for February in the U.S. economy. Um, so, again, you know, we, there, there could be a lot of, uh, um, a lot of uh, volatility around this durable goods number. Now, looking at the chart, the one thing that you're going to notice, of course, is this um, massive resistance level here, which is 83. Uh, do I think, um, someone just said too big chart. Uh, okay, fine. I can bring it back down. There you go. Uh, but this 83 level is massive. The reason why I extended it was because I wanted to show you price action on the days that big economic data and data was announced. I think that's quite important, Rahul. Um, but 83, very big um, resistance level here. As you can see, um, it, it's, it's historically significant in the in the kind of recent history. Anyway, goes all the way back to August. If you get above there, though, it opens the way to 84. Now, I don't think by itself um, that durable goods. Oh, sorry. The durable goods will get us there um, because again, it's 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 um, you, we we need a few big data, a few data points. But I think that if we were to get a very good durable goods goods number, I think that would probably could certainly help us get us over that hump. So we're currently trading around 8280, uh, 8330 to 83, 83 and a half wouldn't be beyond the possibility, beyond the realm of possibility if we were to get good um, home data and good um, payrolls. Uh, sorry, good durable goods. Combine that with a few risk negative comments out of Europe um, and that could be what gets us over this hump. But really, um, to sustain those gains, what we're going to need um, I think is, um, is, is good economic data, not just relying on safe haven flows if, uh, if, thing, if you know, we get the odd stray comment from a Eurozone official. Now, talking about Eurozone officials, uh, yesterday where also we saw a lot of the price action is Euro Aussie, of course. Um, if anything, if you when you see, um, I'm going to stick with the with the uh, with the uh, Bloomberg charts, if you guys don't mind. Of course, with anything, when you see um, you know stress in the eurozone, obviously you look at Euro Dollar because it's the most widely traded pair. It's also worth looking at Euro Aussie. Um, 
someone's just said a Kiwi and Aussie keeping it in check. I think they are. Um, I think you're referring to the dollar index there, um, which is limiting upside. Is, is, is That's partly true, um, the Kiwi and Aussie, because the Kiwi and Aussie, which I'm going to talk about a li in a little bit, um, they've managed to sustain gains against the US dollar, and that has certainly helped thwart um, what the what the what the what the dollar index has been able to do. But overall, though, it has really, I mean, you know, they are quite a small percentage, really, of, its, uh, of, of, the, of the dollar index. But yes, I agree with you there, that they certainly have thwarted it. Not enough to cause it to drop back. Um, of course, though, you know, fi over 50% of the dollar index is, is euro dollar, is what's euro do what euro dollar is doing. So any euro dollar weakness is going to have a, a good, a positive impact in, on that. Uh, but I think that's a good point. So on on that note, then Euro Aussie. When you when you talk about kind of Euro maybe capitulation, stroke Euro uh, being you know a, a problem in the Eurozone that's kind of very fundamental and could have big consequences for the currency, you should look at Euro Aussie because the Aussie's been doing very very well. It's one of the top performers in the F in the G10 FX just over the last week, whereas the Euro is very weak. And of course in FX, what you want to do is trade your trade your strong currencies against your negative currencies, and you can just look at you could just look at that um, I'll create just a little chart for you here just to show you that just bear with me um, it may seem really simple but you know this is sometimes kind of what you want to do this euro this is um, Aussie dollar orange line uh, euro dollar uh, white line so basically they're moving in completely opposite directions which obviously suggests euro weak Aussie strong uh, why not kind of combine the two trade euro Aussie um, and that fell through a really important level yesterday I mean it dropped over 200 pips dropped through the hunt the 200 day moving average which is 124.15 it's current trading 122.85 um, as you can see, massively, uh, very important resistance level. Now, we are fighting some support here. Um, obviously, kind of, you know, sub-122 is a big level. Um, I think that we could potentially get down to sub-122. Uh, obviously, the kind of, you know, the big move is, is, is over. But if we, if we do see a recovery back towards 124 um, or even one, kind of 123.80, I think that would be where, the good, where a good place uh, where, you, where one could uh, or where some selling interest uh, may be found um, I do think that the fact that we've, we cut through that, that 200 day moving average suggests that you know we're not going to go too much higher that gains are going to be capped now um, I'm just going to show you the other chart just to, so we can take a quick look as well, uh, this is the hourly. This is the hourly chart. So as you can see, finding some good resistance just below that one, uh, some good support. Sorry, below that 123 level um, on a daily chart as well. Momentum still very much to the downside, but as I said, that kind of 12170 to 80 level uh, should be good support in towards maybe you know. This, the medium term, certainly this week anyway, because we are in holiday thinned markets. But you know that the way that we just cut through that 200-day moving average is is really significant, I think. Um, the other thing I want to show you was Swissy. Swissy's been quite interesting. Um, you know, we the reason why I want to show it to you. Sorry, this chart is a bit funny. Um, the reason why I wanted to show it to you was because uh, we're getting very close to this key resistance level at 95. So uh, we tried to test it. We backed away from it. But as you can see, we keep going back up to it. Um, it suggests to me that, you know, maybe we've made a bit of a low here. And the fact we've got that very long uh, lower daily candlestick and then we ended up positively. That was yesterday. We had, we had tested sub-94 yesterday. Um, but we've since uh, we've since moved higher. Um, obviously, above there we've got kind of 90, 95.30. That would be a level that we need to get above, um, and certainly like you know a nice daily close above to get us towards kind of 96. This kind of 96 and a half level, which are the highs from August last year. So I'm just going the Swissy is really on my. Um, the Swissy is really on my uh, on my radar right now, and if we were to get a close around about 95.15, 95.20, um, I think there could be some buying interest around that level, um, because obviously, you know, it looks like we could potentially be breaking out of this congestion zone. So, it suggests to me that you know, if we do get that that 
break above 93, uh, sorry, above 95.15, that maybe this consolidation, consolidation period that we've seen is coming to an end and we could be about to extend another leg higher. Um, obviously, whether or not we get to kind of the 99 levels, um, you know, I'm, I'm not 100% sure. But um, remember, dollar Swiss, some people just think about it as being a risk currency. But, you know, in an environment where the S&B is really putting, all, putting the brakes on Swiss appreciation, combined with the dollar that potentially is moving on the back of not only safe haven flows, but also uh, stronger economic data, that can be quite a powerful mix. So, uh, so I'm going to watch that one really, really closely. Uh, obviously, the yen, people do want to talk about the yen. I understand that fully. Um, Corroda has been talking. Uh, but as you can see, we've kind of come off. We're still in that consolidation phase a little bit here. Uh, we've come off. Now, we have found um, some very good support, sub-94. 90, sub that, that is a real buying zone. So kind of 93.80, even 94.05, that is attracting buying interest. And we do think that, you know, buying on the dips is the, is the key thing here. Um, again, kind of 95.10 uh, is, is, a, is a key um, key resistance zone and kind of the, certainly over the next few days and then this 96 level. Um, so we think we're going to get back there. Remember next week as well we've got the Bank of Japan. And what we've seen with the Bank of Japan, just Governor, just since he's been in power, so just over the last week, has been a bit of sell the rumour, maybe buy the fact. So it doesn't usually happen. Um, but he was sounding very dovish today, and yet we still sold off. So um, <clears throat> the yen is still attracting some buying interest. People squaring up. Remember, it's the end of their financial year, the end of March. That does tend to have an impact um, occasionally, um, up with some upward pressure on, on the yen. So do watch out for that. Um, but this is, you know, I'm, I'm all yours for some questions now. Do let me know if you've got any. I know we've run a little bit over, but I'm aware that we started late, so I'm happy to take a question or two. Dollar CAD looks interesting. It does indeed. Um, that's a good, a great one to bring up. Uh, Dollar CAD has started looking interesting. Um, let's take a look at it here. It really has fallen off. Obviously, those kind of like you know, we, um, you know, nice sharp drop lower, a uh, real series of lower of lower high of lower highs, uh, lower lows. Nice downtrend going on there, very much in the short term. We need to break below this 102 level, maybe 10180, um, and then that could open the way back towards this kind of cluster of daily moving average support, momentum to the downside as well. Um, I would be looking for kind of a, a clean break of cut or a daily close certainly below 10280. Oh, sorry, 10180. Um, some people have been you know, the CAD had been, you know, under a lot of pressure. Dovishness, of course, from the Bank of Canada had hurt that. But I think now there's a bit of a reassessment going on. People are looking at it thinking, hang on a minute, if the Aussie's going to do, if the, if the U.S. economy is going to do well, then so is, potential, so is the CAD, Canadian economy. They're very big trading partners, right? Likewise, I think there's been just a little bit um, of uh, the CAD following the MEX. As well, let's take a look at that. Just bear with me one moment. This is the Mexican peso here. It's followed stock markets. Very, it's um, followed stock markets. Now, let me just do this the other way around. The, the, the Mexican peso versus U.S. dollar. It has followed. This is inverted, so it's the peso versus the dollar rather than the dollar versus the peso. As you can see there, that looks fantastic. Um, nice kind of uptrend. Obviously breaking above that level in March, heading you know highs, multi-year highs here. I mean, let's just take a look. You know, we're going all the way back to 2011. Um, to those highs from 2011. So this is inverted. Usually when you see the chart, it's actually quoted the other way. So it's the dollar against the MEX, and then that's kind of pointed, uh, rather than pointing north, it's pointing south, obviously. Um, what, we, what we are, uh, you know, we think the CAD has got some chasing up to do. Um, so even just looking at it, let's just take a quick look at CAD MEX. It's a very strange cross. It's quite expensive. Um, but what we've seen is the CAD just start to base against the Mexican peso as well. Uh, around about that, just ahead of that 12 level. So if we see this continue to move higher, then it suggests that it's just a little bit of rebalancing with people thinking, hang on a minute, I've trade that, traded that MEX. So I had a really nice rally higher in the MEX. That's looking great. Hey, you know, the CAD could really start doing well against, um, against the... Um, Against the, uh, the, the, against the dollar as well on the back of its exposure to the U.S. economy, I'm going to 
maybe you know combine those two so it's quite an interesting cross this one especially because it's showing signs of it abating now we do obviously want to get above this kind of 1220 level we're not there yet if we get above there I think that could attract some buying interest up to 1250 even 1300 which was the highest from the start of this year um, okay Dean has asked a question we saw a sharp drop in euro dollar yesterday wouldn't you expect a retracement long or is there too much sentiment short um, Dean I think you're making a good point I think it depends on your um, on your time frame I think I would expect a bit of a retracement and that's we've seen that to an extent um, but again we do think the gains are going to be capped at 129.50 to 60 um, and the, the, the reason why is that we think there is a lot of sentiment that is quite short out there. there there doesn't seem to be any compelling reasons to buy the euro right now people are just going to look to sell it short at better level at a better level so I think any sign of strength we're going to see a lot of weakness so retracements will be low but I do agree with you I think there is the potential for some especially if things calm down in Cyprus especially as we get towards kind of maybe quieter markets but overall I think partly because we are in Easter week and things will be quieter um, that we could actually just see some traits some sideways movement as you can see here very much looking at the range now it's a 200 pip range we can even narrow that down really to 100 pips 100 129.50 to 128.50. Um, great question, though. A couple of really good questions um, there. I hope you like the Cab Mex idea. I know it's a, it's, it, it's an unusual one, uh, but even if you don't trade that and you want to trade the CAD, um, if you expect the CAD to continue doing well, I would look look to it to uh, to appreciate against the Mex as well, because the Mex has been a very strong currency. The CAD has been quite weak. Um, also, look of course at the, um, the 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 Aussie CAD too. Okay, everyone, I think we're done. I know I've kept you. I do apologize for that. Apologies for the late show up. Um, the, the reason why was it was I'm going to blame Webex. There you go. I'm going to, I'm going to shift the blame somewhere else. Um, someone just said, do I mention that in my book? What, CAD next? I didn't actually, no. Uh, but I, uh, that's right, I do have a book out. So, uh, so that's going to be on sale from tomorrow on Amazon. It's called Kathleen Brooks on Forex. But, uh, but anyway, thank you very much. If you do get to read it, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, okay, everyone, um, that's it for me. Enjoy your, uh, enjoy this, uh, the, the rest of the trading week and um, if you're taking some holidays enjoy them as well uh, I will I will uh, be refreshed and back um, next Tuesday for our next webinar uh, thank you everybody enjoy um, and good luck trading this week thank you